Thank you for joining us today on Positively Charged Biz. We are here to motivate, inspire, and support our listeners as they write their life stories. We are a proud founding member of the Real Disrupt Podcast Collaborative, and you can check out more awesome podcasts at realdisrupt.com. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a positive and productive day. On today's show, we are going to dive into diversity and inclusion and the importance and value of having a diverse team and client base. I would like to introduce you all to Dr. Steve Iacovelli. He is the owner and principal of Top Dog Learning Group, a learning and development leadership, change management, and diversity and inclusion consulting firm based in Orlando, Florida, with affiliates across the globe. Steve and Top Dog has had the pleasure of working with some great client partners who we consider to be members of our pack. He's worked for Fortune 500 greats like the Walt Disney Company and Bear to amazing nonprofits like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the American Library Association, as well as large university. Steve is a rare breed of professional that understands the power of using academic theory and applying it to corporate setting to achieve business results. Steve, we are thrilled to have you here today. And Thank on you. Positively Charged Biz, we like to start at the beginning. So please tell us, what was that pivotal moment in your life when you decided to put your career in the teaching and importance of diversity and inclusion? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking, Laura, and thank you for having me on the show. I, I you know, I, I thought about this for a little bit, and and I think it's it's actually two points that kind of merge together. Okay. So I I first started really getting into the concept of teaching leadership, but through the lens of being more more inclusive. When I worked at Disney, I actually worked at the the cruise line for five years as an internal leadership consultant. Which side note, that was like a sweet business travel gig. I gotta say, you know, I'd go on board a ship once you know, every few weeks and sail the Caribbean and you know, do my training classes and stuff and come back home and hang out for a couple weeks and go do it all over again. It was, it was pretty nice, but, um, but, it, but it was a really like the beginning of planting the seed to, to start to think about, you know, what does it mean from a leadership perspective to be more inclusive? And then flash forward to um, late 2007, I was working, uh, I won't share the name of the a global manufacturing and direct selling company. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but I got fired. And I have, I have no idea why to this day. <laughs> and um, I mean, and, and you know, that's Florida's a right to work state. They can say, oh, wow, I don't like your black shirt, Steve. See ya. And you know, you've, that's it. Um, but even to this day, how many years later, I don't know. But it was such a beautiful blessing in disguise. And talk about looking at the glass being half full. Um, I found myself without a role without a job, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And, and I, I get this, um, this, this call from my best friend who actually I started Top Dog Learning Group with part-time when we were actually still at Disney. And I kept it, you know, we kind of kept it moving. She worked her way up the Disney food chain. And she's like, I have, I have news for you. I'm like, I'm funny, I have news for you too. So she came out for dinner and, uh, and, and we sat down and I said, you know, what's your, what's your news? She's like, I'm moving to Paris for three years wow. to run the Disney University over there. And I'm like, that's amazing. And, uh, and she's like, what's your news? I'm like, I got fired yesterday and I have no idea why. She's like, what? She goes, and so we talk a little bit. She's like, well, why don't you come with me? It's like, what, what, what do you mean? She's like, just come for a week. You can, you know, you speak French. You can help me settle in. Um, you can take care of my, my, her beautiful chocolate lab potter, uh, help him get settled in. And, and you know, we're sitting there. My husband's just all quiet. And he kind of turns to me. He goes, why don't you go for a few months and figure your stuff out? I'm like, right. what? So I moved to Paris for about two-ish months, was a puppy au pair for this beautiful chocolate lab. <laughs> and then in the afternoons, I'd kind of sit there and like, what am I going to do with my life? And I, you know, sitting in cafes and just walking around the beautiful city of Paris. I mean, it was such a, such a blessing. And I, I figured out like, you know, instead of getting a, 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 a quote unquote real job, I had a business infrastructure from a part-time, let's turn it into a full-time and just see what happens. And of course, 2008 was a fantastic oh, time to start a business. Perfect timing. <laughs> You can but, say thank you to my industry for exa that. Exa exa exactly. But it, it, of course, it worked out really, really well. And, and to this day, you know, 12 plus years later, uh, Top Dog's been my main focus. And, and we're extremely passionate to really help leaders be more consciously inclusive and, and more effective in anything that they do from a leadership perspective. Yeah, great story. Love that Thanks. story. That That is wonderful. So, okay. So let's dive into diversity and inclusion. And I will tell you, you know, I, I actually sit on the board of an organization where I'm in charge of a visionary program that actually is all about bringing in fresh talent into my oh, nice. industry 
but diverse talent. And I will tell you, you know, 2020 has certainly been a year of, it's the buzzword, right? <laughs> Diversity and inclusion is the buzzword. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's certainly more than a buzzword, but yeah. you find some people just using it as a general classification of, oh, we should be better at this. But Steve, I wanna go honest. I want to go into, mm -hmm. you know, I can tell you if, if you come into my industry, this is, I'm not even saying anything bold. This is honest. Everybody says it's a bunch of old white men. <laughs> that is what my industry yeah. is. Yeah. And that is literally the generalized statement. We never understand why it is, but it's something that we have to address. So please tell us as leaders, what do we do to intentionally make sure that yeah. we are being diverse? Yeah, it's a great question. And so when I do these kinds of workshops with clients, when I could go to clients, now I do them online, which is fine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, people are, are at mixed positions when it comes to being more, more inclusive in, in their perspective. You know, some of them are vol were voluntold to be in these workshops. Some are like excited to be there and, and everyone in between. And so I, I always phrase it where, you know, that when you're a smart organization, there's three wa reasons why you focus on being more constantly inclusive and embracing diversity and creating a culture of belonging. The okay. first is the law tells you to, you know, there's punitive reasons why if you don't engage in this kind of behavior, you're going to get fined or, you know, jailed or you know, whatever is the right, the right reason. So, so it's a punitive thing. That's kind of a negative thing. Then on the complete opposite side is it makes the world a better place. You know, people feel that they belong. Everyone feels uh, included and respected and all that good stuff. So that's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum. In the middle is it makes good business sense. So yeah. while, while you, you know, you might avoid the bad stuff and, you know, you might say, well, I don't know if I really think it makes the world better then fine. That's your prerogative. I obviously don't sit there, but people can resonate that like, really, this is better for business. Tell me how Steve. Well, you know, if you Google the business case for diversity and inclusion, you will get a ton of research out there that shows more diverse, uh, more diverse boards of directors, leadership teams, you know, you, you add different genders, different ethnicities, um, different ways of thinking. The, the stock goes up, the price is better, the ROI is much better than having a whole board of, of you know, cisgendered white dudes kind of running the show. And so um, when you start to think about one of those three ways, you know, people can, can relate to at least one of them, if not all of them. And, and that's kind of where I, I have that starting point with folks and say, you know, this makes the world better. And that's what I believe. But you know what, you're probably here because you want your business to be successful. Then think about it from this perspective, this is better for your business. And what's the coolest part though, Laura, is when people start from the business part, they eventually creep up to the like, wow, this does make the world a better place too. Right. It's like, yes. And so that's kind of like the, the nice way to start it. And then once you kind of get on board with that part, then it's a little bit easier to start looking at what are the tactics that we can take in our business to be more consciously inclusive? You know, where are we recruiting from? Um, what types of, of people do we bring in? Are we being uh, kind of unconscious bias in our own recruiting efforts when we're doing interviews? All these different pieces and parts are easier to kind of examine when we're on board with, okay, this is the right place to take our business. Yeah. And let's dive into that part of it because I can speak, you know, I can only speak for my industry that I've seen for all these years. It's not intentional. You know, we, no one has gone out and said it should just look like this. Um, but yet there has to be a reason, right? And, and I will tell you from, from an age perspective, I can yeah. tell you that, you know, I have another running joke in, in our industry is the mortgage industry is there's nothing sexy about it. There is nothing <laughs> where people wake up, you know, some 22 year old kid that just graduated college saying, I know what I want to do for the rest <laughs> of my life. I want to give out 30 year, the largest debt anyone will get in their entire life. I want to provide that to people. Now, of course, that's not how we view it. We view sure. it as we help bring families home and Absolutely. have them make the biggest decision of their, where they're putting the roof over their yeah, family. Sure. But to someone graduating college, they've heard, oh, it's time to pay the mortgage again. Oh, I'll never pay this mortgage off. Yeah. Or they hear about the subprime crash of 2008 and they run away. Yep. So we've seen that we've struggled with bringing the next generation in because of all of those factors. So it's kind of been whoever's been in the industry has just kind of moved along. 
So what are, besides just bringing in the next generation, also mm -hmm. the diversity hasn't yeah. been there. So what are some methods, some ways that we can all be intentional yeah. in bringing it in? And I, and I think it starts, first of all, let's define what diversity really means. Okay. And, and, and so, um, the, you know, when I work with organizations, I, I, I kind of probe them and ask them to say, you know, define it for me. And, and you know, some groups are like, oh, of course we're diverse. We have blank month. And I'm like, okay, that's a good, that's a good start. <laughs> but um, I mean, there's a lot of models out there. I use one by uh, these two amazing women in Los Angeles, uh, Garden, Garden Schwartz and Rowe. And they created, it was initially called the four layers of diversity, now it's five. Um, but they, it's a way to kind of really understand what diversity means. And so they, they say for all humans, we are these five layers, but in the very dead center, like picture like a bullseye, and that's kind of what they, they have envisioned. So the very dead center in that, the center of that bullseye is personality. And so when you think about what makes every human diverse, it ultimately comes down to our unique personalities. Even twins will never be the same person. And so, so that's the beginning. And you have things like, uh, if you've heard of Myers-Briggs, introvert, yeah. extrovert, those yeah. types of stuff, that's where that sits. And then yeah. the next layer out is what's called the internal dimensions. And these are the ones where organizations have blank month and, and it's race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, physical ability. Um, and I'll put an asterisk on that one kind of for, for a moment. But these are things that pretty much are, are static in your life. Um, you know, I, I, I and, and there's a difference between, of course, race and ethnicity. Race is biological, eth uh, ethnicity is cultural. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm Caucasian, I'm a white dude, but I would probably most identify with my Polish heritage, which is okay. you know, the celebrations that we did. I grew up in Philadelphia area and that was kind of our thing. So that's kind of the thing. I asterisk uh, physical ability because, you know, it t typically doesn't change, but of course, as we age, things happen, stuff goes on. That one is a little bit more malleable. Then the next layer out is, is what's called the external dimensions. And these are the things that by design change quite often. Um, uh, marital status, parental status, education, income, personal hobbies, physical appearance. These are stuff that, you know, can change and that's great. You know, where I live, where I went to school, what my income's like are all malleable. But the cool thing is they impact how I look at the world and my diversity within it. And then the next layer out is organizational context. So depending on what business I'm in, you know, I might work at a company and I'm in marketing, I'm in sales. Uh, I was part of an acquisition so that impacts how I look at the world, but that little different stuff. And the last layer out that they just added not too long ago was country of operation. So they're saying kind of the bigger where you sit is actually influences how you look at the world and your diversity. So for example, um, you, you, a lot of my clients for whatever reason are, are German nationally based companies. Huh. I don't know how that worked, you know, Bear being an example. So you do see the cultural influence of the German culture onto right. the operation of that business and, and, you know, and that kind of permeates throughout. So I always use that as a starting point because when we say let's be more diverse, I say, what does that mean? Right. And um, yes, it does mean race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, all that good stuff. But it can also mean diversity of thought. It could also mean that, um, well, I want to make sure that I have people who have various, various degrees, various um, education and uh, experiences all that good stuff. Yes. Now also be careful not to use that as an excuse where you, you have all white dudes. You're like, yeah, but they all went to different colleges. Yeah. You know, be careful with that, but it's just a good way to kind of start that, that framing. And then, and then really being a, a conscientious on the okay, What do we have based upon that model? Now, how do we kind of diversify that? So again, is it, um, you know, looking at our recruiting practices, we're always posting the same job, uh, one ad or whatever you want to call it in the same spot. Well then demographically look at who goes there uh, is it the same same you know white folks that go there right. are you are you creating a culture of inclusion um, so because you know studies show that uh, the next generations and I say this as a Gen Xer um, are, are really looking for businesses and places to work that embrace diversity inclusion and, and create yeah. a sense of belonging so you're just thinking through the strategies and how you're operating your business and, and asking yourself, the, well, why do we do it this way? And, and is it getting the result that we really want? And then kind of going from there. Right. No, makes total sense. And, and I totally agree with you that when you have diversity of all different kinds, it gives you different perspectives. And not just about your business, about your clientele. I mean, yeah. once again, looking at my industry, we're doing business with different communities, right? We're doing business with different age groups, different yeah. ethnicities. And when it's all the same group of people, you can never truly connect. Like you use the yeah. example of the Polish community. Yeah. You know, people like to do business 
with people that are similar in some way. So by having a diverse team, you're able to connect with different types of people yep. because your team is diverse. Yep. And then therefore, no, you know, maybe someone else can't give you the insights of the Polish community cultures and traditions, but you can. You can yep. say this is very important and this is what someone purchasing in a Polish community in Philadelphia this is what's important to them. Yep. This is what they need to have as part of your business plan. And, and the interesting part too is, is that you, know, you just, it, it's this weird line for trends versus stereotypes. Right. And, and so you have to really kind of understand that, you know, well, typically millennials like that. I have so many people who come yeah. up to me and say, does your business teach, you know, generations in the workplace? They say, no. And I don't for a reason because I know a lot of millennials who don't embrace technology. Right. I know a lot of uh, baby boomers who are massively tech savvy. Now that those go against the stereotype bunny ears, if you're not watching me right now. Um, <laughs> but you know, you have to be very mindful that ultimately it boils down to the individual. Sure, you can you can go stereotypes like, oh, I know all all gays do this. No, they don't, because uh, right. I will absolutely find someone that debunks the stereotype. But can you start to think about trends? And, and, and work toward that, but know that it's never an absolute because once it is, then you've just fallen into the stereotype world and that's not yeah. really where we want to be. Yeah, that's a very good point. That, that's a very good point. And yes, you can't generalize anything. Nothing is a generalization. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I love you that. Yeah. All right. So let's speak about, okay, so we're aware of, and, and I think it's a great piece of advice about how do you recruit? Where do you recruit? You know, obviously, okay, if, if I'm someone that always posted on Indeed, for example, yeah. well, maybe I also want to post on LinkedIn. Maybe I also want to go to some other, maybe I want to go to universities and I want yep. to contact their career development, you know? Yep. So maybe it's a wide variety of different places. So that is a good point, right? In, in I, ways to get additional. Or if you're, try, if you're trying to get, you know, the, the younger set, says yep. the almost 50 year old, you know, maybe it's, it's none of those places. Maybe it's going to TikTok or Instagram and, and using the ad features to promote an ad for your industry or, sure. you, know, you know, things like that, that, that maybe weren't, you know, and again, this is where, you, as you, as you point out, Laura, very well, there's that, that diversity of thought. So maybe it's asking a millennial, hey, where do you get your information from? And then kind of target it from that perspective. Yep, absolutely. A hundred percent. Good point. Okay. So as we've, okay, so now we're seeing different applicants coming through. Yep. We're making the table literal, you know, not, <laughs> we're not yeah, yeah. actually at the table, but we're, we're, we're figuratively speaking where we have different people sitting at our table, yep. providing perspectives from these different positions, right? So, okay, we've done that. So now how are we handling change? You know, if mm. one thing 2020 has certainly provided to all <laughs> of us is the need to adapt and yeah. the need to embrace change. Yep. So I think that kind of ties into that. So give us some insights in terms of change management and adaptability within our workplaces. Yeah, I, I first kind of fell into change management. Um, I spent a couple of years as an IBM consultant. And, mm -hmm. and so I you know, would travel around with these insanely smart um, techno, and I say nerd in a most affectionate sort of way, says the nerd, nerd here with a doctorate. Um, but these, these, these folks were just insanely smart. And so we would go into a client, they would build whatever technical awesome software solution that we had. My job was to get the humans to use it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's where I started playing around with change management. Well, well, in that baptism under fire with understanding the concept of change was the concept of resilience. And, and that's always stuck with me to this day. As a matter of fact, we, we do workshops on it with my own business. And, um, and the concept of resilience is, you know, you, I can throw change, you know, oh, you have a new technology that you have to use for your business. Great. Well, now you have 12 that are coming out. And, and so as a human, we have a saturation point. And that's, that's kind of what resilience is about. And so how how do you get humans to be okay or to amp up that 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 saturation point for for be dealing with change? And it, there's a lot of studies out there. Um, I have the the top three that I use. Matter of fact, I I, I turned one of my uh, face to face workshops into an online training because now because <laughs> yeah. of COVID. And and so you have no choice. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but but it still doesn't feel good for a lot of folks. I mean, if you, I won't go to nerdy psychology, but it, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a safety mechanism. Yeah. The devil you know versus the one you don't. All these things and how are programmed and wired. But you know, studies show time and again there are strategies that we can do as humans to be better at change to amp up our resilience. The first one is you, you, you the. the aptly new for your podcast name, it's a positive view of the world. So if you look at the world through the lens of a glass half full versus half empty, you're much better at change when it comes, yeah. comes rolling. And, uh, and there's ways that you can do that to actually physically change how you look at the world. Um, there, for example, here's you know, a freebie for your, your listeners and viewers. Um, if you write down the five things that went well for you every night and you write it down, get out your phone in the notes thing, whatever that looks like, and force yourself to find five things, some days it's going to be easy. Oh, what went well today? I closed an awesome deal. I got a new client. This is fantastic. And then there's, there's, a, there's, um, there's that kid's book, Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, yep. very bad day or something like that. Yep. Yeah. So you'll have those days and then you're still forced to find five things and you're like, oh, I can't find one. Force yourself. So what happens over time, over the next few months, um, depending on where your, your starting point, you physically start to look at the world differently. Uh, because you you know you're on the hook to find five things. And it's kind of like when you buy a car, a new car, a new to you car, and you're driving around, and all you of a sudden you're like, it. everybody has a Mini Cooper. What mm -hmm. the heck? It's not because they're like, Steve just got a Mini. He's awesome. I'll go get one too. Now, you have a heightened sense of awareness, and that's kind of psychologically speaking what's happening with this, you know, five things that went well. So that's that's kind of one strategy is to, to look at that. The other is to plot out your own lifeline, your highs and lows. And then you start to analyze, well, you know, have I been in a low point before? Am I there now? But when I was in the past, what got me to that higher point or to kind of that level up? And then reflect on that and apply that to your current situation where you're at. And then the third is, um, and I won't go too deep into this, it's, it's a little bit more intense, but it's you, you use a tool to analyze what is focusing on in your world and what can you control Right. What can you not control but have influence over? And what's that stuff that has no control and no influence whatsoever? And s studies show um, people tend to focus on that outer ring, thinking about yeah. that as like a bullseye again. And, uh, and, and, and then when you have that awareness that, whoa, I'm channeling all my energy on the stuff that I have no control or influence, that's, that's wasting. You're wasting your time and your energy. Move it into the stuff you can control or at least influence and really tackle the change from that perspective. Absolutely. Yes. And those, those are all very, very good advice. And listen, I think, I think it takes a little bit of effort. I think we can't just aimlessly, you know, allow things to happen. Some yeah. of those things we have to take control and, and be, you know, deliberate about yeah. them. Totally agree with that. Yeah. And we've learned so much. I mean, this year, it's taught us how strong we are. It's yeah. taught us the resilience muscle. It taught us that we can adapt and yeah. change. And I believe we're all going to be stronger for it as we move past this period of time. I think it's kind of exciting. I mean, you know, once, and I guess this is easy to say with the recent announcement of a potential vaccine, but yay! Um, yay. <laughs> but, but in all sincerity, you know, I've been saying this for several months as I mean, my doctorate's in instructional technology and distance education. So okay. the world of Zoom is completely in my wheelhouse. I got my doctorate yeah. in 2005 before Zoom was a thing. So like, I, like this is not foreign to me, but what I've seen with clients, people go kicking and screaming pre-COVID right. into, you know, if I were to come to a client uh, last year and say, you know what, that eight hour workshop I usually do, let's do it in four 90 minute chunks over the course of a month. They're like, no, that's silly. We're not doing that. Well, that's what I'm doing now with clients. And they're like, this is actually better. We don't have to pay for travel. We're still engaging them. We're actually connecting with them in a little different way, in a good way. And I think what's going to happen is twofold. One, the way we teach and learn in businesses is, is going to be wonderfully diverse versus just the, let's all go to a conference center and do our thing. And then two, um, employees are going to be free agents now because geography is being taken out of the mix as far as, oh I, oh, I have to be in Northern New Jersey near New York to hire the best people. Maybe not now. Maybe I am going to find them in Orlando, Florida, or, you know, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, or wherever that is, because the, the, the digital distance uh, is, doesn't matter uh, or, or tends to not matter for a lot of organizations. And I think that's going to be the beautiful thing for all of us that we have this different way and, and new way to embrace connecting and communicating and doing work post-COVID. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, we've seen it in so many industries, including mine, yeah. where yeah. all of a sudden, I mean, my industry was always kicking and screaming, like you said, kicking and screaming of utilizing technology. Yeah. But we had no choice. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden you had to do remote online notarizations for closings and you have to <laughs> embrace technology because, yeah. again, you didn't have a choice. There were companies not luckily. I had embraced the whole remote um, prior <laughs> to this. So we were set That's up awesome. since 2011. We were yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. But That's there awesome. were other companies that they still had every single person in the building. And within a week, they had to figure it out. But yeah. now, just like what you just said, Steve, they're like, we'll never go back. This is this is beautiful. Yeah, saving I money. Can hire people all across the yeah. country. And they're now also utilizing other countries. There's people, you know, that are out some offshoring some particular yeah, sure. tasks that why not? What's the difference, right? Yeah. So I think you're right. I think we're we're learning different ways to to connect to people. You know, where before it was, no, you need to get on an airplane. You need to, you know, you need to <laughs> oh, stay yeah. in the hotel. You need yep. to see me face to face. Well, no, maybe you don't. Maybe we could do it this way. And I think the other thing you mentioned about the conference, I think it's opened up that now entire organizations can learn. Not yeah. just the VPs are yep. going to go to the conference. Now let's open it up to the entire yeah. company and raise up some of the people that are in lower positions. Yep, absolutely. So I think that's another opportunity that we've seen that is great for someone like you that's out there distance learning. Teaching. And, at, and as someone who does keynotes at conferences, <laughs> and I had like, I think nine or 10 lined up yeah at the beginning of the year and they initially all went away and I was able to talk to them and say, look, you know, I do that. You know, I don't just teach diversity and inclusion and leadership and stuff. I know how to use the medium. And they're like, and so I did like some convincing yeah. and I work with folks like, you know, Schwab and, and, and Merck and some, some big folks. And what the two things that happened, one, I could knock out like seven of these in one week and not get on a darn airplane. Yeah. I could, I could pass the costs along to the, the client, but like, Hey, you know, I usually automatically charge travel. I'll back that out. Yep. You know, it's a win-win. They're like score. Yeah. And then the, the other thing too was now I'm reaching audiences. You know, I was having frequently having folks from from London and and uh, Western Europe who would attend these things that normally couldn't. To your point, because they didn't have the budget or they couldn't usually fly to the states for a one day conference or whatever. And I'm like, I'm I'm cool with this. <laughs> I'm okay with this. So I think it's going to become a hybrid. Yeah. I think in the future, once everyone's safe, I think you're going to see, I do think some in-person things Absolutely. have to happen. Absolutely. I mean, we all know the bond and the camaraderie and yep. all of that. It is different, but I think it will be a hybrid. I think yeah. you're actually, uh, honestly, I think personally, I think they all should be hybrid because yeah. that way the people that want that in person, or maybe you rotate, you take mm -hmm. certain people, go to an in person, and then yep. the next group switch, you know, and you allow everyone to yeah. get the advantage of seeing it. You know, I, I totally agree. And the, the other thing, though, I'm loving about a, a, a new distance design for like, you know, professional development, all that. Yeah. And so I'll go back to the, the um, eight eight hour workshop that I typically do. And actually it's, it's, it's one of our signature ones on, on being a consciously inclusive leader. It's yep. you know, eight hours immersive talking about unconscious bias and how we, you know, get over privilege and all this fun stuff. So when I broke it into, um, the four, four 90 minute chunks and, and still had activities. I can still simulate going to a flip chart on, on yeah. digital space. It's very cool. But, um, but what you find as a learner is I give you, you know, in module number one, I give you stuff and then you have time to digest it and right. do it and, and play with it and apply it. You come back in week two and they're like, Oh, well, what'd you, what'd you do? Hey, Steve, I went out and did this thing and here's what I learned. Fantastic. Now let's move on to the next topic. And I think that's actually a better way to consume learning from an adult learning perspective than have three days of fire hosing yeah. and that stuff you know it's that's great for networking and that's a better way to network quite frankly but as far as knowledge acquisition and application and changing behavior it's not the best way Correct. and so so i think there's there's an opportunity to, to kind of manage both um to your point and i like your idea with the rotation and and you know, getting those younger folks into the into at least the yeah. digital mix to get exposed to the learning absolutely so yeah and that's a great idea and that really is how we have to consume anything yeah. new you know we can't we can't take that approach of three days because we all know we're gonna yeah. we're gonna keep like this little okay. tiny piece of it everything else is gonna fly right out the window once we get back to our <laughs> right. normal routine i think so it's like, like 
20, 20 ish percent um, is retained yeah. unless you immediately apply it. Yeah, That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. All right. So two questions. So yeah. one, what's that one piece of advice? Oh, wait, actually, I, before we go to the advice, yep. you yep. mentioned unconscious bias. Yes. I want to tackle that because number one, I want you to explain it, right? <laughs> okay, I want you to explain yep. what that truly means. And then I guess, where's that awareness? So kind of just give us an overview of that, because I think that's such an important topic and something that we just don't even realize. Yeah. And, and I, I, I could go on for about 17 hours. on this okay. topic. So I'll, I'll right. keep it very brief. So what is unconscious bias? So the human mind, um, you know, we're, we're getting bombarded by 40, uh, um, we're, uh, what's it? it's, um, uh, we, we get, um, I think I know that figure too. No, about it's, how many, uh, how how much comes into our brain? Yeah, yes, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. our 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 conscious mind um, can manage forty bits of data at any right. one moment. So it's consciously, that you know, that's like processing, thinking through. Um, but we receive eleven million bits at any one moment. So I, I mean, and just think about that. And people are like, yeah. where's that come from? Every nerve ending, all the cones in your eyes, the cilia in your ears. So you're you can manage forty. 40 bits of data, but you're receiving 11 million. So at any one moment, so the gap, and I have to remember how many nines, it's like 99.999996%. Oh, I think boy. that's right. It's 99.99999, nine, nine, or there might be one, one other nine in there. That doesn't matter. The vast majority of the data coming into our heads gets thrown into our unconscious, our unconscious mind, our unconscious self, meaning it's, it's not a top of mind. It's not awareness. So uh, case in point, when we could travel better, um, you're sitting on one of those low cost airline carriers where you pick your seat, like when you get in and you're sitting there and you're, you're actually judging everybody walking yeah. down the aisle. Like you can sit next to me. No, you can't, you can, you can't. That's right. your unconscious bias kicking in because you're not really thinking about it. You're just suddenly having a judgment of a behavior, a reaction to the data being presented, meaning the person walking down. So, so what happens in our heads is, you know, 40 bits of data in our consciousness, 11 million bits, uh, you know, the Delta gap. And, and so we're at constantly operating from this unconsciousness until something warrants our attention to, to be bumped up to that 40 bits of conscious behavior. So, um, you know, if you think about your, your computer operating system, if you open you know, the task manager or whatever is the equivalent, depending on what operating system you play with, you'll see you, if you're like, oh, I'm on Zoom. Well, yeah, Zoom is your one thing, but you might have like 70 other operations happening. That's what's happening in your head. So where this gets into trouble is when we don't realize it and we're making decisions, we're saying things, we're, we're making business um, decisions based upon that unconscious bias, that unconsciousness. And so one of the challenges that leaders have is to really force themselves to be consciously inclusive. And, and when I, I teach my workshops and such on, on these things, I think about it from three different perspectives. You think in, you speak up, and you act out. So think in is you start with yourself. Uh, you think into your own head and like, hmm, what unconscious biases do I have? And, and to find out, um, there's a free assessment online. I'm not affiliated with it, but it's fantastic. Uh, if, you, if you Google project implicit, um, and implicit bias, uh, hidden bias, and unconscious bias are all the same thing, if you okay. hear different words. And so you can actually take an online assessment to find out what potential unconscious biases you have. But regardless of your strategy, you have to start with yourself to figure out, well, well gee, do I have a bias against you know, women, or do I have a bias against gay people or, you know, and you don't even know it. Right. What's interesting too, is we, we sometimes have bias against the groups we're already a part of, which is just fascinating stuff. So you play around with that first. Then the next is speak up. And that's where you, you make the effort to be more consciously inclusive with the people immediately around you. And, and that could be things like um, when somebody says a disparaging comment, I, and this a true story real quick, I was in Atlanta at a client, we're just about to start the meeting, and the senior executive of the project that, you know, two, myself and one of my top doggers, what I call my consultants, mm -hmm. we were there along with like maybe 30 other people from the client's project team. And the senior executive, who's male, and that's important to the story, um, just as we're about to start, he goes, well, you know how all women drive, like just loud enough, and, and everyone just kind of looked and stared and was just like, what did he say? And, and, but at that exact moment in time, everybody who didn't say or refute, which was right. all of us at that moment, didn't refute the stupid statement that he said. And we were engaging what's called um, silent collusion, okay. meaning we were, we were silently or tacitly supporting that because we didn't refute it. 
Right. And I've seen so many leaders erode their, the, the level of trust they've created by not calling those types of things out. And so, so wait, I know you're, I know you're still going, but I have to ask a question. Yeah, please that. do. So what's the recommendation of how to handle that situation? It's, it's brilliant. And, and so in, in my workshops and in some of the stuff, I actually developed six ways, six strategies you can do at that moment right. to combat that, that silent collusion, that stupid statement, everything yeah. from, um, and this is what actually happened in the real story. Okay. Uh, when, when that happened, I'm about to say something, of course, because that's my jam. Yeah. And Lori, my top doctor, kicks, kicks me under the table. She's like, wait. And I, I just love that she right. did that. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But this gentleman, you know, we kind of sat there for what felt like you know, 17 hours, yeah. which was really, you know, I'm just bad. a few moments. <laughs> and um, and, and this, this younger gentleman who wasn't even at the table, he was kind of sitting at a chair against the wall, fairly new to the project, new to the company. He just folded his arms and went, damn. And so, and that's one of the six strategies I've, I, I identify is you, you say a non-word is, right. is what, that, what that does. And, um, and what message that sent was twofold. One, um, that he was not on not board okay. with what was said. Yep. Right. And so, so he at that moment broke being, you know, supporting or silently colluding right. with the stupid statement that that executive said. And then it also brings attention to the person who said it, that if they're operating in their unconscious bias, that it brings it to that 40, 40 bits of right. consciousness, that opportunity. And so that's one of the strategies. Another is to physically move. Uh, harder to do, like if you're in a business meeting where you're like, I'm out of here, you know, oh. can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Bye. But <laughs> but easy to do if you're in like a social setting when we yeah. you can get together and someone says those really horrible, you know, not so appropriate jokes that can hit too hard right. and you just physically remove yourself. So I talk about six strategies. It's called Mop Sam. Um, Mop Sam is... Um, have you ever seen one of those Hungarian pulley mop dogs? Yeah. They look like, so, yeah. so that's called, I call a mop dog. And okay. so when I, when I teach this, I have a graphic of, of the mop dog okay. and his, and his name is Sam, okay. of course. So mop Sam and it's cheeky and silly, but it's a way for people to remember Easy stuff. To remember. Yeah. Yeah. So mop <laughs> Sam is the strategy, six ways to beat silent collusion in the workplace. But that's great. And I love that story because again, number one, we'll remember that, you know, like that's mm -hmm. something that is, and we've all been in those situations. Oh yeah. Whether totally. it's, you know, I mean, that was a great, very easy <laughs> one to throw out there. You know, I'm <laughs> sure there could be much worse. There's ones. a lot more. <laughs> um, but, but that was a really good one. And we've all been in, in those yeah. situations where you're not really sure, you know, how to, and, and, you know, myself, I'm a woman executive in the mortgage industry. And there is many a time where I'm the only, <laughs> and, and it gets challenging when the conversation is sports and the conversation is cars and the conversation is golf. <laughs> right, and right. I'm like, um, okay, let's just speak business. You know, we right. speak business, we right. can have this conversation. And again, it's not that anyone is doing anything wrong. It's they're not intentionally trying to yep. exclude someone, but it happens and it does feel uncomfortable. And it is a situation where I know I'm aware because I'm mm -hmm. the outsider of that situation. Sure, sure. But what about a situation where maybe I'm leaving someone out, where I'm not being yeah. aware of that? What can we do to make us aware of that when we're in those settings? It's a great question. And, and the third area I talk about, you know, think in as you speak up as the po folks around you act out is the greater organization. And okay. so one of the strategies that you can do is let everybody in, in the workplace in the business know this is the desire. I want to be more consciously inclusive. I want to create a, a sense of belonging and respect for everyone. So right. you throw that out there to the greater organization and you say, let's, let's hold each other accountable to, to make that, that, make it that way. And so what that allows two things to happen in the workplace. One, people are given permission to call those things out with respect, of course. Right. Um, but two, then you're allowing the diversity of people's perspectives to come into play and help find yeah. those and shine a light on those, you know, hidden areas that maybe no one's seeing. And, and it could work in great things such as, hey, look at your, your um, hiring forms. Uh, look at your marketing materials. You know, when you, you're talking about like, oh, here's a family. What kind of families are you representing? Is it, is it a diverse group of families? Is it one type of family? Uh, you know, I, I know with, with the work we do, um, 
people are like, oh yeah, I'm creating my PowerPoint slides for my onboarding. And I'm like, great. When you talk about senior leadership, what do you show? Right. You're like, oh, middle-aged white dudes. Yeah, that's not super inclusive. <laughs> so, you know, you, you allow the act out part of this three-part strategy to have everybody else look for those opportunities to be more consciously inclusive and then strive to, to kind of move the workplace toward that, that goal line. Love that. This has been awesome. It's Aww, been so you. insightful. We've had great discussion, great advice, actual tactics to implement and be <laughs> aware of. So this has been wonderful. So Dr. Steve, tell us how can people find you? How can they learn more? Tell us all about that. Yeah, the best way is to, to head over to topdoglearning.biz, B-I-Z. Um, you can kind of learn more about what me and my team do, some of the virtual offerings we have, um, some of the, the online training on resilience. Um, you can find out about my book, Pride Leadership, which just came out not too long ago, uh, which focuses on effective leadership competencies. So happy to have, you know, stop there and reach out to us to see different ways that we can help your business business be more consciously inclusive. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank All you. the best to you, the business, family, everything. Take care. Take. Bye. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Positively Charged Biz. I'm Laura Brandeo, and we are here to motivate, inspire, and support our listeners as they write their life stories. If you have an inspiring story, please email me at laura at positivelycharged.biz. And remember to subscribe to hear more great guests. And connect to us on Facebook at Positively Charged and Instagram at Positively Charged Podcast. Until next time, we wish you a positive day.